Amen. Well, we're in Romans chapter 9, and Brother John actually read the, those verses 14 through 18, but we're going to finish this morning the chapter. We're going to get down to verse 33. And a few points here on God's right to show mercy to whom he wills. <laughs> it's up to him. We believe in that God is a sovereign God. Amen. He knows all. He's everywhere. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. And he has the right to make these decisions, as we're going to see today. And try to focus in and get your thoughts on the Bible this morning and the Word of God. Very important. These passages here, it, it, our salvation <laughs> rests on these verses and what we believe to be true. About God, God's word is, is He's speaking to us. Prayer is us speaking back to God. We have that communication, but God's word, He makes Himself known to the world through His word. He made Himself known, of course, in the Old Testament, God did through the world, through the nation of Israel. The New Testament, He makes Himself known through the New Testament church. Amen. Churches like Bethel Bible Church and other churches that preach the Bible and the gospel. Now, there are very major theological questions here in these verses in this last part of chapter 9, such as, is God righteous to do what he's done? Why has God begun to use nations other than Israel, the Jew, the Gentile, the Jew, or the non-Jew, to make himself known? Because again, in the Old Testament, God used the nation of Israel. We know that. And so... There's questions here. <laughs> the first question was, is there unrighteousness with God because of what he's done? Look at verse 14 again, Romans chapter 9. Paul writes, what shall we say then? Based on what he said in the first 13 verses here. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God because of what he's done and what he's chosen? And what's the answer? Right, right after two words, God forbid. It was kind of like when he talked about in chapter 5 of Romans about sin, where sin abounds. God's grace much more abounded, right? In other words, no sin too great that God, His grace, can't forgive you and accept you as His child by faith. And in Romans 6, 1, he starts off, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound? What was the answer? Same as here, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So what shall we say then here in verse 14 about God's people, the true Israel? <laughs> Look at the uh, chapter 9, verse 6. Chapter 9, f further up from verse 14 and verse 6. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are not Israel. And you say, whoa, <laughs> doesn't make sense to me. Who then is the true children of God, is what he's talking about. Those we saw last week that are following the promise of God, which is by what? Faith. So not whatever your background is, Jew, Gentile, Jew, or non-Jew, no matter where you're from, we become children of God, or you can call it true Israel. You become God's chosen. Talk about Israel as God's chosen people. Yeah, they were chosen to bring forth the Messiah to this world. They did, they've done that. And the nation of Israel as a nation, not individual Jews, but as a nation, rejected Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. And he's talking about now the gospel is open to whosoever. I love that word that we're going to see here used more and more. Whosoever, whosoever what? Trusts Christ, becomes a child of God by faith. All right? New Testament, doesn't matter. Jew, Gentile, you save by grace through faith. That not of yourselves, what? It's a gift of God, not of work. So Paul has the question here in verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness? God forbid. Paul has a shocking question here. Is there unrighteousness with God? Remember what was, that caused the question. God went against the laws of men. Remember we talked last time about Jacob and Esau. Most of the laws, not just in the ancient world, but even I, I told you about my own family when it comes to the firstborn, or you could say the first male in the family. Some, some cultures have that as the main you know, and most important of the children. But God went against the Jewish laws concerning the inheritance left to children. 
according to man's laws back then, the oldest son received the, the inheritance. However, in dealing with Isaac's children, remember Jacob and Esau, God announced the oldest would serve the younger. In other words, Esau, who can't, was born first, would serve Jacob. Why? Because Jacob was God's choice. God's choice may be different than man's choice. Remember when they went and picked the king for Israel after they had Saul, again, disobeyed God as of the sin of witchcraft when he didn't destroy all the Amalekites, remember? And so in God's eyes, Saul no longer the king, even though he was still on the throne. So they were looking for a new king. Remember they went and found Jesse, who had all these sons, and one by one, who did he bring out first? The oldest son. Prophet said, nope, not him. And he went through all the sons and he said, is this it? You know, God told me to come here. Oh, there's one more son I have. He's out, the shepherd boy. When he saw him, God said, that's the one. And he said there, God doesn't see how man sees. God sees what? The heart. And David, we know, is a man after God's own heart. And the same thing here, all right? Is God unrighteous? No, God forbid. This is God we're talking about. God chose Jacob. You know what? even before they were born. So it doesn't matter who came first, who came second. Where's that? Romans chapter 9, verse 11. Don't look up it right now, all right? Don't look it up now. The question is, can God choose to favor certain men and disfavor others and still be righteous and still be a God, a holy God? Is there righteousness with God? Well, Paul's answer is uh, yes, God forbid. It could never be. It's utterly impossible for a thrice holy God, a perfect, inerrant, infallible God to be unrighteous and unjust. So just right off the bat, Paul wants to ask that question here, and the answer is God forbid. Now, number two, my second point, God has the right, because of who he is, to be both merciful to whom he wants to, he wills to, and just, and have compassion. Look at verse 15, Romans 9, 15 now. And he's going to use an example from Exodus chapter 33. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will. God can say that. He can choose to have mercy on whom he chooses and wills. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Then he says, so then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of who? God that showeth mercy. For the scripture says, and he quotes from Exodus chapter 9 now unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up. Who? God raised up who? <laughs> the ungodly Pharaoh. But why did he raise him up? He said, Pharaoh, even for the same purpose, I raised thee up that I might show my power in thee. Yes, God used an ungodly man named Pharaoh to show his power. That my name, there is the result, my, my name might be declared throughout all the earth. God used the Jews the exodus from Egypt and Pharaoh to show his power and that his name, God, Jehovah God, would be declared throughout the earth. It's all about God, everything in the Bible. When David went to fight Goliath, right, that all the earth may know, he said, there's a God in Israel. It's all about God. So therefore, it says here at the end of uh, verse 18, chapter 9, he has mercy on whom he will have mercy and he will harden it on whom he will have hardening. Remember? Remember? where it said in the Bible about Pharaoh hardening his heart. First point here, before we get to that, is God shows mercy as he, the sovereign God, wills. He has mercy and compassion upon whom he wills. So if God chooses to show mercy to men, he has the right to do so, even, listen, when we don't deserve it. This is God's mercy, undeserved merit, God's grace. God's grace is getting what we don't deserve. God's mercy is God withholding from us what we do deserve, which is what? Separation from him forever in the lake of fire. That's what we deserve. So if God chooses to show compassion to men, he has the right to do so, even when men do not deserve it. Is he unrighteous to do that? No, because he's God. He can do whatever he wants. When God spoke these words to Moses that he mentioned here in verses 15 through 18, especially 15, Exodus chapter 33, Israel had just, this, this happened when Israel had just, remember, worshipped the golden calf. Remember, they got all their gold, put it together, and made an image that they could worship. Moses is up there getting the Ten Commandments. And Aaron, everybody came to him, and he was not a good leader. He just said, oh, go ahead, let's do it. And they had the golden calf. 
committing the most serious sin back then uh, the, the nation could, which was idolatry, right? Worshiping a false god. Moses had just interceded after he found out, and God told him, you better get down there. They're doing some very bad things. And when he came down, remember, he threw the commandments, the stones to the ground. But Moses interceded, as he often did, because God's going to wipe out. Let's just start all over with you, Moses. We'll just wipe out the whole nation of Israel. Remember, he interceded and said, what would the Egyptians say? We're out here in the wilderness now. You're going to kill us all after you led us out of Egypt? So Moses interceded on behalf. God spared Israel that day. And he can do that if he wants to. Obviously, he did. If he chooses to be merciful, he can be merciful. That's what he's saying here in Romans chapter 9. He's God. God had mercy on, and, on Israel and compassion. He still does, by the way. Not because they deserve it. <laughs> Obviously, they don't, just like we don't. Israel received forgiveness and mercy because God willed to be merciful to them, and he can. That's the answer. The point is clear. God is not unrighteous, from verse 14. The question, what shall we say? Is there unrighteousness with God? No. He's not unrighteous if he has mercy upon men. Men don't deserve it. They deserve judgment, and God will give this gift. <laughs> it's not unjust or unrighteous for Jehovah God to be merciful and compassionate to whom he wills. So God shows mercy as he will. Secondly here, under the second point, God shows justice too, also as he wills. The event mentioned in, in Exodus 33 about Pharaoh, all right, and in, in Exodus chapter 9 is used as an example. What did he say? God raised up Pharaoh, it says in Romans 9, 17. It means God allowed Pharaoh, listen, to appear and, bring, and brought him on the scene of world history. You know, God can still do that today, as he wills to use men that we may not think deserve to be in the position they're in because God has a, has a purpose for it. We have to trust his, that he's a sovereign God. Remember what it said in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God, even the ones that we don't like. <laughs> There's a lot of people that have been in power and positions that I would say, terrible. I would never think of that person being there. He doesn't deserve to be in there. I'll say this to him. I'll say it. He's a bum. <laughs> you probably say something like that, maybe. Maybe worse. But God has a reason for Pharaoh. Pharaoh was an ungodly, evil man. He was an unbeliever. He was harsh, stubborn, obstinate, who stood against and cursed God as though face to face, the Bible says. God's going to do something, yes, to make himself known through a wicked man like Pharaoh. Why? Because he's God. God does not cause evil. He doesn't tempt men with evil. Pharaoh would have been his evil even before God used him. Had nothing to do with God making him that way, but God was going to use an evil man because he willed it. It was his purpose and plan. Pharaoh had an opportunity that he may never receive. Obviously, didn't receive it. He learned something from not just from God, but from God's servant. Who? Moses, who went to the Pharaoh over and over again, remember. He had an opportunity, Pharaoh did, to repent and change his heart. You know what? Like a lot of people we talk to, he refused. Scripture says time and time again, I'm going to get used to this welder's mask here. Time and time again, Pharaoh himself hardened his heart. But the scripture also says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, what does that mean? It seems, sounds like a contradiction here. It's not. It doesn't mean God caused Pharaoh to, to sin and be stubborn. God never, we said earlier, tempts man to sin. It means that God judged Pharaoh the same as he judges all men. Pharaoh hardened his heart, therefore he was judged and condemned to have. Pharaoh, you have a hard heart. God's law and nature of justice, of equal justice, took effect on Pharaoh just as it does on all men. Pharaoh reaped what he sowed, all right? Well, that's a principle on all. God overruled Pharaoh's evil, but he used it for the good of his people, Israel. God used Pharaoh's evil to demonstrate his sovereign power and to declare the name of God throughout all the earth. The point is this, Pharaoh was a sinful, evil, we know that, man. And God demonstrated his justice through Pharaoh. God acted righteously toward Pharaoh, just, just as men execute justice on evil men and our laws, right? God executed justice on Pharaoh because of 
is evil. God is God, and he has the right to be merciful, as we already said, and he has the right to execute justice as he wills and for his plan and purpose in this world. That's important to understand as we're looking at these verses. Next, God has the right to do as he wills, <laughs> not what we want, but what he wants. Jesus said that in the Garden of Gethsemane. All right, when he prayed and, and sweat drops of blood came off of him about this cup of suffering that he had to bear. A lot of people will say, Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. He was trying to last minute get out of it. No, of course he wasn't. He said, if it could be possible, I'd rather not go this route. But it wasn't. He had to go. Someone had to pay for the sins of the world. Then what did he say at the end? Not my will, but thine be done. That's what we have to say. Sometimes we don't understand always the way God works, but that's the sovereignty. We have to just accept it because he's God and we're not. Look at Romans 9, 19 now. God has the right to do as he wills. He's sovereign. Well, Paul says, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who? <laughs> who, whosoever. Who hath resisted his will? No, he says, but, O oh man, who again art thou that repliest against God? These are people that go against God's sovereignty and his will. And then he says as an example, Shall the thing formed, in other words, the creature, say to the creator, <laughs> Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? He's forming it. The clay can't say to the potter, why did you make me an ashtray? <laughs> Hath the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Oh, now he's talking about two different groups here. The obvious answer is, you know, I went to do this and the mask got in the way. <laughs> the obvious answer is, does God have the ability or the right? Yes, he does, because he's the one that made it. And he uses the, the potter as an example. Listen, God has the right to do as he wills, as Jesus prayed. Not my will to God the Father, but thine be done. We need to pray likewise. Men object. Listen, human nature objects, especially unsaved people, to God's sovereignty, to his right to run the world as he wills. And the reason men object to the right of God to rule and reign as he wills, is men want to, the right to determine their own fate, so they think, to live as they wish on this earth, but yet they still want an assurance of a good life in the eternity. They don't want God or anybody else telling them what to do, what their fate is. And this is the spirit of, of pride, self-centeredness, right, and sin that caused men to object to the sovereignty of God. Paul gives three points here that establish beyond a question the sovereignty of God, all right? First thing, man has no right to reply against God. We saw it in what Paul just wrote here under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Man has no right to reply against God, no right to accuse God of being unrighteous and unjust. Any man who replies against God that way has a very low base view of God and too high a view of himself pride how can the creature that's been formed by a creator god say why have you made me like this that's why i always tell people like i hate my nose i got a big nose or, i have curly hair i'd rather have straight hair people have straight hair they want curly hair people that are tall i want to be short people that are short i'm too short i want to be tall you know when i when, we say i say to my kids you're not happy with the way that's what you're saying by complaining about whatever you're not happy the way god made you and that's what he's saying here we want, again, to determine our own fate. We don't want anybody telling us about anything in our lives, and that's, again, going against God and his will. How can man dare, what Paul's saying here, question the supreme being who made the universe? <laughs> who is man to think that he can accuse God with being unrighteous? Sinful man. <laughs> what does man think who he is in accusing God of being immoral and showing partiality or favoritism? I told you before I got saved when we used to read the Bible about it, and especially when even early in my Christian life, when it said, to the Jew first. I'm like, why? Are they better than anybody else? Oh, of course, that was wrong thinking. I, I didn't know any better, but God is God. He can do as he wills. He has the whole picture he sees where we don't have that option. We're not omniscient, all right? We're not omnipresent. We're not eternal as far as our, our thinking goes and all-powerful. 
He knows what should be done, and he does it. Man will be foolish to question God with this thing of him being partial or unrighteous or unjust. When man questions God, here's what we say. We show how finite, not infinite, how finite we really are, how foolish we really are, how wicked and depraved when we question what God is doing. Second, God's right, and the example he gave here of the potter and the clay, God's right over a man is like the potter's right over the clay. And you can't miss this point. It's very important here. We are to co correctly understand the clay exists. The potter didn't make the clay. It's there. Of course, God made us. We know that. He created us. We're not dealing with creation here, but with God's governing or, and rule over creation. God is not creating and talking about the potter creating the clay. He's taking a lump that exists and using it and making something for a purpose, all right? Paul's not speaking of God creating men to be sinners here, right? God doesn't purpose anyone or condemn anyone to hell. God wills, God's not willing, it says, right? 2 Peter 3, 9, that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Well, then, then what is this verse really saying? <laughs> That's what it's saying. God uses the clay as he finds it. He takes the clay, put in parentheses, man, molds it, and uses it for what? His purposes. All men are born, we're sinners, we're born into a depraved world. God knows the hearts of us when we're born. He knows a heart is subject to be honorable or dishonorable. All right? It's a choice. If the heart is responsive to the things of God, then God gets the gospel to that person and quickens or makes alive his heart, saving him and begins a process, making him a vessel unto honor for him and his purposes. God also knows if a person's heart is subject to hardness, to selfishness, and rejection of God. That person is made unto a vessel of dishonor. And believe it or not, God even uses the sinner and the rejection of him as well for his glory, as in the case of Pharaoh. Amen? The point is this. Listen, God has the right to use honorable and dishonorable men to work all things together for what he deems is best. He has the right to use good men and evil men to work it out for his purposes, which are always ultimate in the end, good. His right is no different than the potter's right over that clay. Number four, God has the right to put up with evil and unbelieving men. He calls them here vessels of wrath in order to share his glory with some believing men, which he calls here vessels of mercy. Look at verse 22 through 24, chapter 9. What if God, willing to show his wrath, make his power known, endured with much long suffering? I'm glad God's a long-suffering God, aren't you, that he put up with me. The vessels of wrath that are fitted to destruction, eternal separation from God, right? And that he might make known using these vessels of wrath he might make known the riches of his glory on who the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory god knows that we don't even us whom he hath called not here's again now not of the jews only but also of the gentiles aren't you glad for the the end of that verse <laughs> so if you're not of jewish heritage today you're very glad about that listen god is willing to suffer long suffering to tolerate to put up with to endure evil men or vessels of wrath for a long time. Why? Why doesn't God just go ahead and do away with evil men? One reason. He's fulfilling his purpose in this world, his plan of redemption. Yes, even through evil men. God is making known the riches of his glory on the believers, the vessels of Murphy. God is preparing others. The ones being prepared for this is who? Jews and non-Jews. Jews and and Gentiles. Note, even this fact points towards what? God shows no partiality. He's no respecter of persons. Jew or non-Jew. Do, God doesn't pick some for sin and hell. We're all originally destined for that and some for heaven. It's a choice we make. All right, listen. But there's, there's two words here I want you to notice. They're very important. Verse 22 is the word fitted. Note the difference between this word fitted and the word in verse 23, prepared. All right, look at verse 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath, make his power known, endured much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted, 
fitted to destruction. And then in the next verse, he has a word there called prepared. I, I underlined it in my Bible. You can if you want. Verse 23 says that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore what? Prepared unto glory. The vessels of wrath, in verse 22, are fitted to destruction, but the vessels of mercy are prepared unto glory. Which group are you in? Listen, there's no mention where he says fitted to destruction, vessels of, all right? There's no word, an agent there for who fitted the vessels for wrath. It's not identified. The scripture says they're fitted for destruction, but in verse 23, there is an agent mentioned. God himself had a four prepared others unto glory. This, this allows for an interpretation here that how did they fit themselves for destruction? That's what they did. They themselves fitted themselves. God said he prepared those for glory, but they fitted themselves for destruction. Two different words, right? Men fit themselves for wrath. God does not tempt men to sin, James 1.13. The opposite is true. God saves men. He wants all to come to righteousness. He prepares for beforehand all those who come to him for glory he has prepared first timothy 2 4 says god will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth but we know not all men will be why because they fitted themselves for wrath second peter 3 9 verse i've quoted already god is long suffering to us we're not willing it's not his will when people go to hell they're going to hell against god's will they've fit themselves for wrath and destruction. But God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Second, the whole passage that we've read to you here has to do with proving that God is not unrighteous. The question that was first asked in verse 14. He's just. Listen, if God created men to be sinful so that he could condemn them to wrath, he'd not be righteous and just, even in our finite world. He would make something evil and it would be considered unrighteous and unjust. God does not fit men to wrath. Men fit themselves to wrath. And that brings me to the third point. Why? Because the whole world is sinful and depraved already. There's none righteous, no, not one, right? Romans 3.10. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. God knows the heart of every man. He's sovereign. Why then does he not stop all the evil and sin in the world instead of letting it go on when he knows some men are going to be fitted for wrath? One reason, if God did that, there'd be no vessels of mercy, no more believers to be brought and offered as brothers and sisters to Christ, no more people that God could demonstrate his mercy and love. Scripture says, and it clearly states, why God does not end the world and keep any more evil men from being doomed they're dooming themselves god is willing to put up with evil men vessels of wrath to what shower his riches of his glory upon those who believe on christ verse 23 listen when we truly realize that god has had mercy on us what does it do it causes us to fall on our face before him he has loved us to the point of forgiving our sins through the lord jesus christ and seeing his love should break us into humble adoration and worship. It's the love of Christ, the Bible says, that constrains us. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, that's how he showed his love, then we're all dead, and he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him. That's the result of gratitude. The love of Christ constrains us to live unto him which died for them and rose again. The fourth point here, there's nothing inconsistent or unjust for God to look at two undeserving sinners and see one as a vessel unto wrath, again, by their own choosing, or another as a vessel of mercy to his own preparing. <laughs> so I don't understand this. Now I'm really confused. <laughs> Join the club. Some people go so far as to say there must be something in man, something that we have done for God to choose us, but that's not the case. If that would be the case, then it would go against Scripture that salvation is by God's grace through faith alone, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's nothing good about any of us. The final point is the conclusion drawn here in Romans chapter 9 at the end, verse 25 through 33. 
God has judged the rejection of Israel, again, as a nation, by choosing persons from Gentile nations as well. We said this last week, true children of God are people from all nations who pursue by faith the salvation and the finished work of Christ on the cross. That's Jew and non-Jew. And that's my last point, five here. God has identified his chosen long ago in the Old Testament, yes, in prophecy. That's in Romans 9, 25 through 33. I'm going to read this real quick and we'll be done. Some of the words in your Bible, if you don't have a, a new translation, there's going to be words say, what does that mean? Look at verse 25, and, and Paul's going to give examples again to people that knew the Old Testament, the Jews that were listening there, and Gentiles too. As he saith also in Osi, you know what that is? Hosea. All right? Actually, it's in Hosea chapter 2, verse 23. Here's what Hosea said. This is an Old Testament prophecy. I will call them my people, which were not my people. And her I will call beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, again in Hosea, ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Then he says, Isaiah, which is Isaiah, also crieth concerning you, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 22, concerning Israel. What did he say, the prophet Isaiah? Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as, again, Isaiah, or Isaiah, which is chapter 1, verse 9, said before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom, I said Sodom there, that's Sodom, and like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? Here comes the question. That the Gentiles, which followed not after the righteousness, have attained to righteousness? Uh, the answer to that is yes. And then he says here, even the righteousness, which is of faith, that's how you attain it. But Israel, all right, this is the first part, is non Jew, uh, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, they have not attained to the law of faith. All right? I'm sorry, they have not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it, Israel, not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Who's the stumbling stone that the Jews stumble at? Jesus of Nazareth. As it is written, they're going to quote now from Psalm 118, verse 22, I behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Amen. Listen, the Bible says in John chapter 4, verse 22, salvation is of the Jews. All right, we're not, we're not saying anything nasty. Or we, we're not against Israel. We love Israel. We pray for Israel, for peace in Israel. Salvation, again, came through the nation of Israel. Salvation is of the Jews. Israel were the chosen people of God to be God's peculiar people to bring the Messiah into the world, to make God known in this world. However, Israel failed they kept the message to themselves and excluded all other people. Israel as a nation even took the lead role <clears throat> in killing God's son. And this is the whole point of these verses, to point out how the chosen people of God today in the New Testament dispensation of grace, they are God's true children that come from all nations of the earth, Jew and non-Jew. And it's clearly seen even in the Jewish prophets that we mentioned, Isaiah and Hosea and in the Psalms. The Jewish prophet predicted this fact, Hosea said, about the Gentiles, they'll be called God's people, the ones that were not called God's people in the Old Testament. They'll be called beloved, the ones who were not called beloved, again in the Old Testament. And they're in a place where it was said they were not God's people. The Gentiles were in the very place they would be called the sons of the living God. Again, that's Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul said. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. It's right, by faith. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek, you could say non-Jew. And then Galatians 3.26, Paul wrote, starting in verse 26, For ye are all, whosoever, the children of God, how? By faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, that's not water baptism, by the way. Baptized into Christ means immersed in Christ's in salvation of Christ. You have put on Christ. 
There is neither Jew nor non-Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all what? One in Christ Jesus. The chosen are the remnant of Israel. <laughs> the great prophet Isaiah predicted that only a few among Israel would truly believe. The first disciples, apostles, and followers of Christ were Jewish. This nation would be a great number of people as the sand of the sea, but only a remnant would be saved. Isaiah predicted God would, would have a remnant or a seed of believers in Israel, that's Isaiah 1.9, that Israel's wickedness back then would be compared to Sodom and Gomorrah. But even through that, God has saved a remnant. There are Jews, I know them, you probably know some that have trusted Christ as their Messiah. Paul wrote this in Romans 11, we didn't get to yet, in verse 1 and 4. I say then, had God cast away his people? He's going to talk about what he said here in, verse 9, in chapter 9. God forbid he didn't cast them away. For I am also an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. In verse 4, but what saith the answer of God unto him? He said, I've reserved to myself, and he's quoting now from uh, 1 Kings 19, I've, I've reserved to myself 7,000 men who've not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Remember Elijah and the false prophets? And Elijah went under the juniper tree and felt sorry because of the queen. And, uh, Jezebel said, we're going to do the same thing that what you did, Elijah, those 450 prophets. We're going to do the same thing to you about tomorrow about the same time. And he went, oh... I'm only the one left to take. He said, no, I have 7,000. And that's what Paul quoted here from 1 Kings chapter 19. There's always going to be a remnant, all right? The chosen are the pursuers of righteousness, not our own, but the righteousness of Christ by faith. It's by faith. Gentiles, non-Jews who have always been considered base, self-righteous, all of a sudden turn to God for righteousness by faith. The Jews, God's chosen, all right, missed that righteousness because they went about to, to make their own righteousness by keeping the law. And Jesus was hardest, hardest on the religious Jews that thought they can get to heaven on their own good works, their own righteousness. He said, you've made the word of God of none effect, Jesus told them, by what? Their tradition, their religion. Do you know God hates religion? Yeah. He hates religion that tries to make a person think that by doing good works, we don't need to trust Christ. I'm good enough to get to heaven. God hates that. You make an idol out of yourselves. The chosen are not pursuers of righteousness by works, but by faith. Israel was zealous to secure righteousness. They thought they were doing all the right things. They were very sincere, but they were what? Sincerely wrong. They sought righteousness by the law, Paul says, not by faith. Galatians 2.16 said, Knowing a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And so the chosen are not those who stumble over Christ, as Israel has done. 1 Corinthians 1, 23, Paul said, We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, but unto the Greeks, the non-Jews, foolishness. <laughs> and then last, the chosen are simply the whosoevers of the world, those people who have by faith trusted in the finished work of Christ. We always say, aren't you glad you're saved? <laughs> Doesn't matter your background, Jew, non-Jew. John 3.15 says, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Whosoever. Verily, verily, John 5.24, I say unto you, He, you could say whosoever, hears my word and believeth on him that sent me, hath present tense, everlasting life, shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And of course, Romans chapter 10, the next chapter we're going to get into soon. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart as the faith that God hath raised him from the dead, that's the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I want to finish the rest of that there. Verse 11 of Romans 10. For the scripture saith, Whosoever... <laughs> Believe it on him, shall not be ashamed. 
For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek or the Jew and the non-Jew. For the same Lord is overall is rich unto all that who call upon him. And here it is again, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from eternal separation. Saved from hell. Saved to a new life. Everlasting life. Free gift from God. Amen. Is this very confusing? It shouldn't be. There's a lot of scripture we covered today uh, in the last half of Romans chapter 9. Again, Paul just very, very, <laughs> it really is simply showing that the true people of God, and God is not unrighteous by saying there's vessels unto honor and vessels unto dishonor. Men choose. We have a choice. We've been born sinners. We choose to sin. God doesn't make us sin. God didn't make Adam and Eve sin. They chose to sin. We've born sinners. We're sinners by birth, the original sin, that if, if for no other reason, if we could live a sinless life, which we can't, we'd still go to hell because of the original sin of our human parents. But we do sin. Sins of commission, sins we commit, and then sins of omission. James says, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth not to him, it is what? Sin. <laughs> Three areas there were sinners. No way we could get to heaven. And God made a way, amen, through Christ, by faith in him. God's sovereign. He uses things in the world so that people will know that he, through Christ, we can be saved. God used Pharaoh, he used the example there, to, to do great things, of course, to re have Israel released from over 400 years of slavery and bondage. We, in this dispensation of grace, are released as well from the bondage of sin. Amen? You say, I'm a sinner, I've been saved by grace through faith. Amen? You happy about that? Say amen. <laughs> I'm happy about that. Did it come because of my good works? No. It came because of my faith and trust in Christ when someone gave me the gospel. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I'm thankful for the Bible today. Amen. If you were here and you're saved, you got saved because someone shared the Bible, the gospel, the good news with you. Not because you deserve it. Did God know that? Yes, he did. <laughs> Does that mean that we don't go witness to anybody because God knows? No, we go because we're commanded. All the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Ye shall receive power, he said in Acts 1, the last words of Christ, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be what? Witnesses unto me. We're witnesses. You have to be saved. You have to be the noun. You have to be a witness before you can do the verb witness, right? I'm really confusing some of you. You have to be saved before you can tell others about Christ. Well, if you're here this morning, you've never trusted Christ. We're going to have a hymn, not singing, but a hymn of invitation. I wonder how many of you knew the first song that we sung today just by listening to the music. It was Lead Me to Calvary. Lead Me to Calvary. Someone led me when I was 27 years old to Calvary to see that I was a sinner and I needed to be saved. And that night, after hearing the gospel... I had heard it before, but never trusted Christ. So faith comes by hearing, but faith hadn't come to me at that point. I'm a little, I'm a little Italian. They say gabadust. You know what it means? Hard-headed, hard-hearted, thick skull. And so it took me a while. When I was a kid in Jersey City, there was a black man that used to be outside the candy store. I lived next door. You know what he handed out? Chick tracks back then, 1960s, imagine. You know, I loved reading comic books in that candy store, so the chick track to me was another comic book. I'd open it up and gave the gospel. Did I get saved? No. But eventually, when I was 27, because faith comes by hearing, over maybe to me a period of years, I finally realized I was a sinner, that I needed to be saved, and was led to Christ by a godly woman that was a, a, an evangelistic, a soul-winning woman that cared for my soul, as we should for others. And she led me to Christ. Lead me to Calvary. She led me. And uh, I trusted and prayed and received, confessed with my mouth, as it says in Romans, and believed in my heart, Romans chapter 10. We're going to do that next several weeks, Romans chapter 10. Don't miss it. If you haven't trusted Christ, you need to. You need to. Say, why? Because we're sinners. And God's a holy God, and we cannot stand before a holy God with sin. You are sinners out there. If you're saved, you're forgiven sinners. Amen? Don't ever think that we get our noses up in the air because we've been saved a long time that we're better than anybody else because we were in the same shoes as them, amen? Jesus loved, God so loved the world. That includes all the sinners, right? 
And he gave his only begotten son. That's the, that's the message. We're the messenger. Let's get the message out. Amen. We're going to have the musicians come up at this time. We're going to close with a short prayer. And then there'll be music playing. And it's time for you to sit there and just contemplate and think about God's word. Let it saturate your heart and soul. Think about what God said. He said, well, you, you talked real fast. And I don't understand. You did a lot of scripture today. I'm, my head is spinning right now. I need a message of your... If you want, I'll give you a message of my sermon. I've just got to print it off my computer, and you can take it home and digest it there if you'd like. It's a very important message here about the grace of God, the long-suffering of God, how he uses men for his will. What's his will? 2 Peter 3, 9. That none should perish, that all should come to repentance. And uh, hopefully, if you're not saved, seek us out after the service. We'd love to show you what the Bible says about being born again. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Now, as the instruments will play in a moment, Lord, help us to consider your word. Uh, Lord, if anyone here not saved, that they'd seek us out after the service, socially distanced, of course, to talk about salvation through Christ alone and by faith and by grace. Lord, thank you for the, your word. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the Christian life and for the New Testament church. Bless our time now together for these last few minutes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, ladies.